Well, good morning and welcome to our morning service here in Cardiff. And before we begin our service, just wanting to remind our folks that this coming Wednesday, um, we will not have the uh, usual Bible study. Instead, uh, Lord willing, we'll have the Missions Night uh, going to be held in Raymond Terrace um, as part of our Synod uh, meeting. Um, and so um, it will the dinner, you're welcome to join us. Um, we'll start at 6 p.m. on that on this coming Wednesday, and after that will be the presentations. And we'll have four slots of uh, uh, mission speakers. I believe uh, the first one would be um, Mariam from Talim Center in India, and also Pradeep and Samit uh, on behalf of the um, church and school uh, for the free church in central India and also and then after that would be um, uh, Mark uh, Landrum from uh, CWI or uh, International Mission to Jewish People and then after that uh, Bob Quinn from uh, the um, AIM ministry and so uh, so yes uh, do you, I do uh, encourage you to um, join us and uh, uh, for dinner and also for the uh, presentation uh, missions night uh, in Raymond Terrace and after the morning service is the uh, fellowship luncheon today and then also Sunday school before the uh, afternoon service um, next Lord's Day uh, Lord willing we'll have the um, Reverend Jim Kassinger occupying the pulpits uh, here and also Raymond Terrace and, uh, and as you know, this coming week is uh, the week of uh, Synod. Do you cover your prayer as I'm still the moderator, the outgoing moderator, um, and uh, also for George Ball as the incoming moderator for Synod. And, uh, and, um, and next Lord's Day, I should have the uh, new banner uh, magazines. Um, and all the other important information is printed on the bulletin. Thank you. So let us worship God. Let us sing to God's praise by singing uh, from Psalm 89. Psalm 89 from Sing Psalms, and that is on page 117. Page 117 of Psalm 89. And we shall sing to God's praise from verses 1 to 8. Verses 1 to 8 of Psalm uh, 89. And so here we have this um, uh, praise, this thanksgiving. Uh, to God from the psalmist David and he is uh, being mindful of something that is so uh, special about the Lord and it is not uh, simply his power it's not uh, simply the glory God has over his creation but his great love how great is his love I will extol the Lord's great love forever. Your faithfulness to all I will proclaim. I will declare your love stands firm forever. Your faithfulness in heaven you maintain. And so this great love is a great covenant, faithful love of God. And it is a love that can stand the test of time. It is the love that uh, uh, is reserved for the people of God. And it is the love that is initiating, the love that is keeping, and the love that will continue to carry on um, for the good of his people. And we see that love expressed in that uh, covenant context in verses 3 and 4. You said, I made a covenant with my chosen, and to my servant David I have sworn, I will ensure your line shall last forever your throne to generations yet unborn. And so we see uh, that love uh, has gone to that covenant uh, blessing and promise and is resting in the one who shall, uh, who is uh, now sitting on that throne of glory, the very Lord and King of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us sing to God's praise, verses 1 to 8 of Psalm 89. Stop. 
So um, at this point of the service, let us uh, unite together in prayer. Let us seek the face of the Lord. Let us stand. O oh Lord, our God, as we come and you bow down before you, as we bow our heads and our hearts in before your holy presence this morning, we confess that you are that faithful covenant-keeping God, the God of mercy, the God who is um, from everlasting uh, to everlasting uh, the God who is our Heavenly Father for the sake of your beloved Son, the King and Lord of David, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, we praise you, for you are indeed the one who has that great covenant and faithful love for your people, the one who is full of compassion, full of grace, full of kindness. And Lord, we, as we meditate upon your great love, uh, we confess, Heavenly Father, that without your uh, covenant loving kindness, uh, without your mercy, uh, we would certainly be completely removed uh, from the face of the earth. Without your mercy towards us as your people, uh, we would still be a wandering people. Uh, we would be uh, like wandering sheep without a shepherd, running to and fro uh, in that spiritual darkness, in that spiritual desert of our souls in sins and misery without hope without god and without christ in this world and so lord as we come before you this morning we are once again uh, reminded of that glorious truth that you are the one who is still pleased to be merciful unto us for the sake of your son the lord jesus christ and so heavenly father uh, we thank you for that glorious, great uh, covenant head, the one who is now ascended, the one who is now seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, the one who is that glorious, great high priest, the one who is still praying for his people, even on earth, um, so that uh, the faith of your people would not fail. And so, gracious God, help us to bow before him, him as our only king, as our uh, as our uh, almighty prophet who is willing to teach and lead us and who is the one uh, uh, who is pleased to reign over us and to, uh, to guide us. And so, Lord, help us to rejoice in the wonderful gospel truth, uh, not because of who we are, not because of what we have done, but 
because of the person and the works of the Lord Jesus Christ, his incarnation, his perfect life on earth, and his life-giving work of redemption on the cross and at uh, the resurrection. And so, Lord, may we humble ourselves this morning to bow before him uh, in love and in adoration and that we may truly lay hold of him, knowing his power, that um, the power of his uh, <coughs> conquering death, uh, the power, his resurrection power that gives hope to uh, all the children of God. And so, Lord, we come uh, rejoicing in that wonderful gift of the forgiveness of sins, uh, that uh, we can know of that uh, pardon through nothing of our own, but through his uh, shed blood and so gracious god teach us and remind us of that great love that we may be led uh, to confess um what manner of love is this that we should be called children of god and heirs uh, with christ and so heavenly father help us as we gather on this lord's day uh, this morning to meditate upon uh, your love and your grace uh, through your word blessed by the power of the holy spirit and continue to work in our hearts. And we thank you for such a wonderful day, especially as we live in a world uh, of busyness, a world of endless, endless uh, panic and uh, fear. Uh, you have given us this Lord's Day, uh, that day of rest, that we may, uh, the day that you have appointed uh, to rest from our earthly labors and to find that rest in the eternal Sabbath rest of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that you would... Um, uh, grant us that rest and uh, for those who are still uh, restless uh, even here this morning in their souls and those who are listening in lord we pray that you would uh, arrest them that you would grant them uh, by your grace that rest in christ jesus alone and lord we thank you for all the blessings uh, given to us and may we rejoice with that exceedingly great joy and once again we pray for those who are not able to gather with us uh, to worship with us here uh, this morning um, we pray that you would uh, have your hand of blessing uh, your healing power upon them and guide them through and through that they too may know of your divine uh, abiding presence and so lord continue to guide us and enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth and pardon of our sins, for we ask all these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, the scripture reading for this morning is from uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. And I'll read from verses 14 all the way to the verse 30. Verses 14 to 30 of Matthew 26. And so hear the word of the Lord. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day, of the feast of unleavened bread the disciples came to jesus saying to him where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the passover and he said go into the city uh, to a certain man and say to him the teacher says my time is at hand i will keep the passover in your at your house with my disciples so the disciples did as jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me the son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed it would have been good for that man if he had not been born 
Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And may the Lord bless his holy and inerrant word. At this point of the service, the offering for the Lord's work is to be received. And for those who are not able to gather here, please make use of the electronic means. Well, let us uh, once again unite together in prayer. Let us give thanks. O oh, Almighty God, Father of mercies, we praise you once again for the fact that you have created us and that you have been sustaining us and you have been enriching our lives with so many blessings, even the blessings here on earth. But above all, Heavenly Father, our faithful God and Father, we thank you uh, for the unbounded love in redeeming us from sin and slavery into salvation, into service, through your only beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you have uh, given <coughs> uh, to us even the means of grace to grow in grace. Um, even this morning, as we gather around your holy word in this setting of public worship, and we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for that sure hope of heaven that is ours now th um, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But, O oh Lord, our God, you have also commanded us to call upon you, to bow, to come before the throne of grace, uh, to, uh, to call upon you in all of our needs. And you have uh, shown to us that you are so merciful, you are faithful to hear our cries and our petitions. And it is not because of who we are, but because of the glorious, victorious merits of the Lord Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. And so, Lord, teach us, therefore, to forsake all other helps and to find that refuge, not in the things of people in this world, but in him who is the eternal tabernacle, the one who is the Emmanuel, God with us, Christ himself. And so, gracious God, we come before you praying for our uh, brothers and sisters, uh, especially those who are part of the persecuted church all over the world. <coughs> especially in this trying time uh, as we see and heard so much hostility uh, against uh, your saints in many places, especially um, during this time of the coronavirus. And Lord, we pray for them. We pray for their family members and we pray for their witness and that you would grant them strength and help. And Lord, we pray uh, for those who... Um, uh, suffering for the sake of Christ in order to maintain that faithful uh, witness, in order to uh, defend the crown rights of the Redeemer all over the world. Lord, we pray for strength, we pray for grace and wisdom, and we pray that you would be pleased to lead us and teach us also as your people to be faithful, to stand firm in the truth of of God's word. And so, gracious God, teach us these things. And also we pray um, for uh, the vital ministries 
especially uh, MERF, uh, the Middle Eastern uh, Reform Fellowship, that they may truly be a beacon of light in those hostile lands. And uh, and that uh, not only uh, people will be strengthened uh, through the message of the gospel, but those who are still living in darkness may come to know that true light of the gospel. And, uh, and Lord, we pray uh, also for a, a ministry of international mission uh, to Jewish people, CWI, as they uh, seek to share the gospel of Christ as the only uh, redeemer and king and messiah with the Jews all over the world. We pray that you would bless them and protect them as they uh, seek to honor your name. And we also pray for the uh, work of uh, the Free Church in India. We thank you for the recent uh, church uh, plans of and uh, preaching stations in uh, many areas. Lord, we give you praise and thanks, and we pray that you would continue to uh, sustain and protect the preachers and the uh, and the eldership uh, all in those places, and that you would continue to uphold them and guide them. And Lord, we also remember our dear brother Mick Ali as his. Uh, serving among the Samburu people in Kenya. Lord, we pray that you would continue to uphold him and strengthen him in uh, <coughs> his health and ministry. And we thank you for the, uh, uh, the additional ministry, uh, ministry staff uh, to serve alongside. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, uphold him too. And we pray that the gospel of Christ would go forth and among the Samburu people. And so, gracious God, we pray that you would continue to bless uh, those ministries. And Lord, as we seek to continue our worship and to study your word together, Lord, grant us the wisdom from on high that we may learn to put our trust in Christ alone. And so help us in these things and pardon all of our sins, for we ask all these things in Christ's name and voice sake. Amen. <coughs> Well, let us continue our worship by singing from Psalm 26. Psalm 26 from Sing Psalms. Psalm 26. And that is on page 30. And we shall sing from verses 2 to 11. Verses 2 to 11 of Psalm 26. And here we have this. <clears throat> prayer this request out of humility uh, before the Lord from, the, from this child of God and he humbly cries out to the Lord test me O Lord and try my heart my inmost thought survey your love surrounds me from your truth my feet will never stray and so here we see the blessing of that um, self-examination in the light of God's word, according to his word. And, and he's asking the Lord to search his heart, to test him. And so why? So that he may know more of the covenant love and faithfulness, not of man, but of God. And... Uh, and there's that desire to forsake sin uh, to, and to cling to the Lord. I do not sit uh, with worthless folk. I shun the hypocrite. I hate the uh, wicked's gathering with them. I will not sit. But, uh, but not only do we see the uh, godly hatred against sin and towards sin, but we, have, we also see the in, something increasing, and that is the love of God, the love for the Lord and all that he has done. And in verse seven and eight, verse seven and eight, I will tell of all your awesome deeds, proclaiming loud your praise. Your glory fills your dwelling place. I love your house always. Yes, it's just love, love for the Savior, love for the presence of God, and uh, and so this is uh, uh, the the goal, isn't it? There, the love for the Lord increasing, blessed by the Holy Spirit. And so let us sing to God's praise. Um, verses 2 to 11 of Psalm 26.
my dear friends, one of the many things that we do when it comes to any significant events, such as birthdays, anniversaries, or other special occasions, is that we try to get together for a meal with all the family members, relatives, and friends. And indeed, many, if not all of us, would agree that these are joyous and happy occasions to cherish the memories uh, and the moments together, especially in sharing a meal together. Well, at the same time, those occasions can be times where we may encounter uh, awkward and even shocking moments. And maybe for that reason, uh, not everyone enjoys receiving invitations to those events as there can be embarrassing moments. I remember as a child, for a long time, I dreaded those invitations to banquets. As I could, uh, as many times, I had older relatives who would try to recall the embarrassing moments of my uh, childhood when I was a little kid. But other times can be also daunting. For example, to hear some relative or loved one saying to us that he or she has been diagnosed with terminal illness. Or someone who had been in some uh, terrible accidents with long-term damage to even their day-to-day -day functioning. Yes, things like this can turn a joyful occasion into a solemn awakening. Indeed, for those of us who have experienced situations uh, like that, uh, those occasions can cause us to have serious questions about ourselves. And we may ask those questions, such as what? What am I doing with my life? What is the most important thing in life? 
uh, what should be my uh, greatest uh, concern and care. Why? Because in those situations, we are reminded of our frailty and we are led to do some soul searching. To really see who we are and whom we need. And yes, maybe we have heard of stories of people who, after witnessing some of those uh, traumatic events, and they have made some life-changing amendments. Maybe we have heard of someone who has amended, for example, their unhealthy lifestyle or quitting certain bad habits once and for all. Now, my dear friends, as great as those amendments may be, we need more than that. We need the change that affects not just our mortal bodies, but our hearts and our souls. We need the change that we cannot do for ourselves. But yet, God in Jesus Christ is pleased to give. And yes, we need the word of God to bring us to that realization of who we are and how much we need Christ. Not only to examine us, but to save us. And so let us continue on in our series of studies in the Gospel of Matthew. And the sermon title for this morning is this. The King's Revelation at the Passover. The King's Revelation at the Passover. By God's grace and with his help, we shall be considering verses 20 to 25 of Matthew 26. And we shall consider these verses under the four thoughts. Firstly, the shocking revelation. Secondly, the searching question. Thirdly, the solemn declaration. And fourthly and finally, the shallow conviction. The king's revelation at the Passover. The shocking revelation, the searching question, the solemn declaration, and fourthly and finally, the shallow conviction. My dear friends, especially for those of us who have been studying through this chapter, would know that this chapter is bringing us to not only the final week of the Lord Jesus' public ministry, but indeed to less than the 48 hours. And we may remember on last Lord's Day, we have looked at on that Thursday morning how the Lord Jesus sovereignly made provisions for his disciples for the Passover meal. And we may recall how Peter and John did according to what the Lord Jesus had appointed in his word. But now, when we come to verse 20, and we read this as it says, When evening had come, <coughs> he sat down with the twelve. My dear friends, the word of God in here takes us to that place, to the upper room where the Passover meal is served. And maybe for many of us, we have read this passage so many times that we don't notice the significance here. Friends, the scene here before us is absolutely packed with the care of the Lord for his disciples. There is, first of all, the providential care, the providential care. Not only as we looked at last time, both Peter and John would have been so amazed to see the power of the words of the Lord Jesus over every single detail of the, of the preparation for the Passover meal. By this time, at the evening <coughs> in the evening, the rest of the disciples can see the, prov the providential care of the Lord as the Lord Jesus took them to the house of that man. Remember, Peter and John, they didn't have to send out any messages <coughs> to the Lord Jesus to let him know or to let the rest of the disciples know where they are, where they are located. And indeed, the Lord Jesus never had to say to the ten disciples, well, my dear disciples, let's go to the city and walk around. It's about time. Well, why don't we knock on a few doors? Hopefully we'll find Peter and John there. No, not at all. Even in this, we see the sovereignty in Christ's providential care. Not only has he the best intention for his disciples, he has the absolute power and wisdom to overrule all things. 
At this time, the ten, the other ten disciples, can we imagine that? As they walk into the man's house, and then they walk upstairs to the upper room to find not only Peter and John, but everything as Christ has commanded. And they too can witness the providential care of Christ. And we see also the faithful care of Christ. Because it is not just the place being provided, but all the other provision. For this important uh, Passover meal, have we thought about this? These disciples, they are mostly, most of them are Galileans. They are far away from home, far away from their families. The Lord Jesus doesn't abandon them at this time. Rather, he has taken them in like what? Like a family. And him being the host, the provider. Yes, no one in Jerusalem would take them in to eat the Passover. But the Lord Jesus would, even in these critical hours. And indeed, my friends, <coughs> we need to be reminded that the Passover meal is not simply about eating certain foods to be uh, 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 on that day. It is far more than that. Because the practice is that as they gather around the table, they are to reflect upon something. The faithfulness of God and the mercy of God in delivering, in rescuing the children of Israel out of the bondage and slavery in Egypt. And not only would they recall the hardships of their forefathers, but how also how God would remember his covenant to deliver his people. <clears throat> and they would certainly recall the ten plagues and all the way to the last night in Egypt, as well as the parting of the Red Sea. And so the disciples would be reminded of God's faithfulness, not because the people themselves were great in strength or in number compared to other people groups, not because they were better than the other, uh, than, than the rest in the sight of God. No, not at all. The faithfulness of God is down to God's own covenant mercy. And so even the Passover meal at that very time, even as they ate the lamb at the Passover meal, they would be reminded of God's faithful provision. And it is at that very time something happens. And so let us look at our first point, the shocking revelation, the shocking revelation. And we can read from verse 21 as the Lord Jesus says, Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. My dear friends, can we picture the scene before us? This is probably the last thing that the disciples would expect to hear from the lips of the Lord Jesus. Especially, as mentioned before, the disciples have been dwelling and thinking about the one thing, the faithfulness of God. But now the Lord Jesus says, one of you will betray me. This saying would have dropped like a bombshell. Friends, can we imagine how startling this is? I mean, it is so sudden. There is no introductory statements. There is no background story, as it were, to lead to those words in verse 21. The Lord Jesus didn't say to the disciples, you know, my dear disciples, you have been with me for the past three years. We have been through a lot. And now we have, we're now eating the Passover meal together. However, I have something, some bad news for you. Are you sitting down? Are you ready to listen to what I have to say? No, nothing at all. And this announcement, this revelation is so unexpected to the disciples. As they reflect on the faithfulness of God at that very time. And here the Lord Jesus tells them that, tells them about the unfaithfulness, the betrayal of man. In today's language, people would say, what a shocker. The bomb has been dropped. Friends, it would not be, it would not be that shocking if the Lord Jesus says, 
one of the multitudes, one of the pilgrims who has come to Jerusalem will betray me. That would not be that surprising at all, as the disciples themselves know there is so much opposition built, being built up against the Lord Jesus, especially from among the religious leaders of, it, of Jerusalem. And they would not be that surprised if some of the, from the crowds will betray him. But that is not what the Lord Jesus says here. He is saying and he's looking at his 12 disciples and he says, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. This is not a guess or a suspicion only, but a certain revelation. The word assuredly here in the Greek is actually the word amen. In other words, he who is the amen, the faithful witness, is saying that this betrayal is for sure. It is not a possibility. It is not a hunch. My friends, we need to think, consider this. What is actually betrayal? What does it really mean to betray? It is far beyond an honest mistake. This is one of the worst evils in relationships. Because betrayal is an act of great disloyalty. We know that at the international level, especially during the war times. Even in history, there were soldiers, officers, who would betray their own country by helping an enemy country. And yes, we see this kind of betrayal even more so in our own technologically advanced age. Espionage, spying, leaking critical national security information, military information, intellectual property, and so on. And even on a more personal level, say even among friends, betrayal takes place when our trusted friend broadcasts our personal information with other people or taking advantage of us using our kindness and love for their own selfish gain and that's not it we also see another painful picture of betrayal especially in marriages when a spouse commits adultery breaking the covenant of marriage with selfishness, treachery, and deceit. And betrayal, also in, in here, in the Greek, means to hand someone over, to give up on that someone, that someone whom we are supposed to have that close and loving relationship to whom we had pledged our loyalty. And in that, whether it be a soldier, a civil servant, a friend, or a spouse, is turned into an enemy. I know we live in a world where trust and faithfulness in relationship mean very little. A world that finds happiness in the so-called juicy gossips of unfaithfulness, betrayal, affairs. But the word of God tells us that it is a serious matter. It is a serious sin, especially considering the nature of the relationship. And this is what makes this revelation from the Lord Jesus so troubling, so startling. Because he is saying to his 12 disciples, beyond any shadow of a doubt, one of them will betray him. The twelve disciples for whom the Lord Jesus has called and cared for. In the past three years, with complete faithfulness, complete loyalty, and even now as they gather around the table having this Passover meal, they are treated by the Lord as a family. And this is what makes it even more painful. This betrayal comes from not the outside world, but from one of those who has been made a recipient of, have been made recipients of the goodness and the faithfulness of Christ. Someone 
that is so close, not only in proximity, but in fellowship. And not only that, there is another aspect that shows how painful and startling this shocking revelation is. And that is the recipient of this betrayal. The Lord Jesus is not saying to the twelve disciples, well, one of you will betray one of my disciples. I mean, that would be quite painful. As the disciples, think, think about it, they have been living, working, eating together for the past three years. No, it's far worse than that. For the Lord Jesus is saying, As surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. Yes, the Lord Jesus has been nothing but good, perfectly good, perfectly faithful, perfectly kind, perfectly merciful to all his disciples. Yet he is made an object of betrayal, even from, from even the closest group to him on earth at that very time. Just as Psalm 41 verse 9 prophesied, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And perhaps as we come to this shocking revelation from the lips of the Lord Jesus, there may be that tendency for us to look at this account and to hear these words as no more than a piece of history. Like when we study a textbook in history classes, from that, per from that third person's point of view. Well, friends, why do we try to do that? Because these words are uncomfortable words. They are shocking words. And we can, tr we can try to dis disassociate ourselves from what the Lord Jesus is saying. And we may say, well, I have read this passage so many times. I know who that particular person is, I don't need to be more concerned about it. My friends, especially for those of us who name the name of Christ, it is all good and well if there, is, if there was only one Judas, if there was only one betrayer, only one who would hand the Lord Jesus over in the whole course of the history of the church of the Lord Jesus. And that everyone else is 100% faithful, 100% committed, never ever thought of denying the Lord. It would have been good and well for us to take that third person point of view. If that, was, if that were the case. But even the history of the early church tells us that it is not the case. There were other betrayers also. Remember, like whom? Remember, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy concerning their faith, they have suffered shipwreck of their faith. And not only that, we also have someone who was so involved in the gospel ministry, such as him, Demas, who has forsaken Paul, having loved this present world. Yes, they too have betrayed the Lord Jesus. They gave up on him for whatever lust of the things and people of this world. Indeed, this is not just confined to the days of the Lord Jesus on earth, nor the early church only. It has been throughout the history of Christ's church, many Judases, many Demases, and sadly it is also affecting even the why the reformed evangelical world in our own days with some so-called well-known ministers and preachers who have come out to deny Christ. And so, dear people of God, we need to hear these words from the Lord Jesus ourselves because it tells us that no position in the church, no experience in Christian service, no amount of religiosity can exempt us from hearing these words from the lips of Christ. And so let us look at our second point, the searching question, the searching question. Friends, imagine the scene before us. As soon as the Lord Jesus spoke these words of warning, there would have been this pause and silence at first. We can perhaps hear a pin drop. But that is, it is not like... 
some of the embarrassing situations we may have encountered at the dining table. Say, if someone said something so inappropriate, uh, we have the tendency, don't we, to just brush it off, pretend we haven't heard it, and carry on without eating. Or maybe someone at the dining table may try to immediately introduce a new topic and to move on, to talk about something else. But we don't see that, we don't hear that with the disciples here. For most of them, the disciples take the words of the Lord Jesus so very seriously. They're not saying to the Lord Jesus in response, Of course not, Lord. You must be joking here. How can it be? No way. It may be true for someone outside our group. Certainly not in among us. No, not at all. In fact, we can see the effect that the words of the Lord Jesus have upon the disciples. And we can read from verse 22. It says, And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Friends, do we see that? The disciples are not simply a wee bit downcast or a wee bit down. They are not just sorrowful, but exceedingly sorrowful with this intense sense of grief. Their conscience is pricked and they are wounded. They are so troubled by the words of the Lord Jesus. But this sorrow, this sorrow is not directed at somebody else. It is not as if the disciples are talking among themselves and say, well, what do you think? I've always think that this Judas is a bit sketchy, a bit fishy about what he has been doing. I never liked the guy. There's something about him, but I just can't not pin down. I'm just so glad that the Lord Jesus has brought this up. No, not at all. Because even at, this, at that time, none of the 11 disciples suspected that it was the, the trusted treasurer, Judas. And throughout the time, they have not come to suspect others. Friends, if we think about it, yet how, how easy it is for us to fall into the temptation. When concerns or suspicions are raised, whether it be in the workplace or in the home or in the wider society, is it not our natural tendency to quickly jump to the conclusion and, says, and say, well, that someone must have done it. That someone, yes, I, I think so. And, even, and it is a temptation that even Christian believers can fall, easily fall into ourselves, even during sermons. It's so easy to say, well, the minister must be talking about some, that person. Phew, not me. But friends, that is not what is happening here among the disciples. They are not suspecting others. They are not saying, is it him? Is it her? Is that a person? That is not the question that occupies their mind. Rather, this, Lord, is it I? Why? Why this, is it I? This is not any sign of spiritual deadness or any lack of faith. Far from it. This self-distrust, self-distrust, is actually a sign of grace, a sign of spiritual life. This is not a statement of hopelessness, but the honest realization of who they themselves are in humility before the Lord. How do we know that? Because they have realized something about themselves. They see that if it weren't for the grace of God, they themselves cannot be faithful. If it weren't for the grace of God, they would all be betrayers to the Lord Jesus Christ. And dear believers, those of us who claim to be disciples of the Lord Jesus, do you and I know these three little words? Is it I? Is it I? Have we come to realize that the continuation of your and my faithfulness in the Christian life the avoidance of betrayal is not down to you or me. 
Our faithfulness in the past is not down to our own determination and power. Nor can that faithfulness in the past be a guarantee that we will never forsake or betray the Lord. Have we come to realize if God leaves us to our own devices without his restraining mercies, we are absolutely and completely capable of doing what Judas Iscariot did. And so as shocking, as startling as the words of the Lord Jesus are, do we begin to see that it is his mercy that we are hearing these words? Why? Is it not so that we may rightly examine ourselves in the light of the words of Christ? And it is only then do we see the intention of these words. Yes, as painful as they may be, the Lord Jesus is aiming for our good to help us to search our hearts, to see our corruption, to see our sinful nature, but also to see our great need for his grace, not just at the beginning of the Christian life, but throughout the entire Christian life. And so, my dear friends, has it become your and my question? Is it I? When was the last time we asked such a question to examine ourselves? Only occasionally, only during the week of preparation before the Lord's table, a few times a year when it comes to communion seasons? Or has it been by the humbling grace of God that we have been made acquainted with these words as part of our spiritual exercise? As 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 reminds us, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Friends, this is not, this is not designed to discourage us Quite the contrary, self-examination according to the word of God is one of the blessed means of grace. How is it so? It is intended to remind us of who we are and how much we need the grace of the Lord Jesus and to take refuge in him. Because in doing so, we are searching what is in our own hearts. And each time of that Self-examination, blessed by the Holy Spirit, it shows how much we need, again and again, the cleansing blood of Christ. And this is what David did in even Psalm 139. The last two verses, he cried out, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And do we see how encouraging this searching question is from the 11 disciples? Because even that question itself, raising that question itself, is a work of God's grace. Because the disciples have been given the right address. They are not issuing this question addressing another disciple. They're not asking their fellow disciples, what do you think? Is it me? Do you think? No, they are, even with their sorrow, even with their searching question, they have brought them all to the Lord Jesus. Lord, is it I? Yes, by the grace of God, in their self-examination, by the words of Christ, they realize who the Lord Jesus himself is. He is not just the one who gives the searching words. He is the one who can answer your and my searching questions in self-examination. He is the one whom you and I desperately need. He is not just the almighty prophet who can reveal to us our sins, but he is the, the one, the almighty physician, who can heal us and save us. And in that sense, my friends, do we see then the blessing of this healthy sense of self-distrust, healthy sense of self-distrust. 
for it brings us closer to the Savior, to rely upon him more and more. And isn't, isn't that what this means of grace, of self-examination by the word of God is designed to do, to draw us closer to the Savior? And not only do we hear the searching question, we see thirdly the solemn declaration. The solemn declaration. We can read from verses 23 and 24. He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. My dear friends, perhaps we may expect the Lord Jesus to immediately give out the name of the betrayer and telling the rest of the disciples what this traitor has already been doing. And we may have expected the disciples with a fury and anger a grab Judas Iscariot and cast him out. And indeed the Lord Jesus has every right and power to do so. But no, that's not what we see here. In verse 23, we are given simply this very general answer. He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Friends, in those days, the custom was to put, in, in eating, in having a meal, <coughs> was to put food in a large dish that everyone can share in the same household. And that is very different from our individual plates with our own portions of food. Even later on, Lord willing, with a fellowship luncheon, we won't share the same plate, but we have our own plates. <coughs> but that, the, the ancient practice is the same dish. And so the Lord Jesus in here, he's not giving, and he's not even specifying whether it is the, the, uh, the, the person having, you know, dipped his hand at the same time with him. And so all of the 12 disciples have shared the same dish with the Lord Jesus. And therefore, the Lord Jesus is not giving extra information as to who the person is. And neither is the Lord Jesus telling the disciples, well, don't feel bad about yourself, just be happy. No, for he knows that it is good for, for their souls to examine themselves. But why? Why doesn't the Lord Jesus give out the name now, and friends, is it not a display of Christ's tender mercy to Judas, even at, <coughs> even at this moment in time, a few hours from the betrayal to take place, the Lord Jesus is still seeking Judas's repentance. He is still showing his kindness, showing himself so willing to forgive, so powerful to save. And the second thing we see in this solemn declaration is that though he, the Lord Jesus is going to be betrayed, he is the one who is absolutely faithful. And we can read in the beginning of verse 24, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. In other words, the Lord Jesus shows forth his sovereignty and his absolute commitment to the will of his heavenly Father. And therefore, friends, the Lord Jesus is not a victim of a betrayer. He is not a victim of someone's treachery. Uh, treachery. He is never a victim, but the Lord, yes, even at that time. And every single thing that the Lord Jesus would do, even the betrayal done to him and sufferings and death, they are all part of fulfilling all the ancient prophecies in God's word, even back in Genesis 3.15 and we may be able to recall passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 that speak of the sovereign plan of redemption carried out by the person and the works of the Lord Jesus Christ in accordance with the scriptures and even in here <coughs> the Lord Jesus is reminding his disciples that this is not some tragedy that he has to go through, but the salvation for his guilty, sinful people that he has come to accomplish by taking the place of the guilty. Yes, in this solemn declaration, we see the tender mercy, 
the sovereignty and faithfulness of the Lord Jesus. However, the sovereignty of God does not cancel man's responsibility. In other words, yes, on the one hand, we have the declaration of the Lord Jesus indicating to the disciples that his betrayal is part of God's plan according to God's word. But that does not excuse, that does not do away with the sinfulness and the evil of sin on Judas's part. For the Lord Jesus declares in the last part of verse 24, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. These are words of condemnation against the one who has no love for the Lord, for who he is as a promised Messiah, only love for money, mammon. And this is what Judas cares about. And because of the heinousness of the sin of betrayal against the eternal Son of God, it would have been good for that man if he never had been born because of the severity of the punishment in hell. And we see that Judas is responsible for his own actions, for his own sins, because he committed them willingly. And so too, it is the prospect for those unrepentant sinners to die in sin, to die unrepentantly, unconverted. It is a dreadful thing. And friends, none of us can afford that. But even at this solemn declaration of the heinousness of Judas's sin, the Lord Jesus is still merciful to him because the Lord Jesus says it would have been. He is expressing that the situation could be changed if only Judas would turn from his wicked ways. My dear friends, how... We need this mercy from the Lord, his divine patience and forbearance. But what is the reaction? What is the response of Judas? So let us look at our fourth and final point, the shallow conviction, the shallow conviction. And we can read from verse 25, the first half, it says, Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Friends, from the context here, we see that Judas, he has been delaying to give a response compared to the other 11 disciples. And in here, we see Judas, he has some conviction. But this conviction is not driven by the words of Christ, but simply by peer pressure. As he is the, and he is the only, and so far, before this verse, he is the only one who hasn't said anything yet. <coughs> And, but he is so concerned about how he may look, how he may be perceived by others, and certainly in his own foolishness, he thought he could hide from the searching eyes of the Lord Jesus. And so at last, he joins in and says, Rabbi, is it I? Yes, he repeated most of the same words as the other disciples. It has the appearance of self-examination. It has the appearance showing a degree of respect. But yet, there is no saving bond to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Just look at how he addresses the Lord Jesus. Not Lord, but Rabbi. To Judas, the Lord Jesus is no more than an esteemed teacher. He is still refusing to bow before the Lordship of Christ. There is no gospel sorrow. There is no brokenness in his heart, even when Christ has been dealing with him in kindness and in mercy. And this, my friends, this mere con conviction is without true conversion. Simply content to copy the language of religion, but refusing to repent before the Lord of religion, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, what about us? What sort of conviction do we have this morning? Is it simply mere impression? Peer pressure from friends or maybe families? Knowing so much the Christian lingo, lingo the Presbyterian terms even, 
but yet no true conviction in the heart and in the soul. And if that is the case, how much we need the Lord Jesus, the one who is pleased to come to give us those words of shocking revelation in order to draw out that searching question in our hearts so that by the grace of God, we may cling to him by faith alone for his glorious salvation. Dear congregation, this is where you and I may find our hope and rest in, in that betrayed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was betrayed, he is the one who never betrayed and will never betray his sinful people, but was faithful and is faithful unto the end. Yes, he was faithful even unto death in order to be faithful to all of his gospel promises so that we may uh, so that we may see how gracious and cling to him and so may we turn to him in repentance and faith and cry out to him lord it is i and lord i need your saving grace your glorious salvation amen and let us conclude our worship by singing from psalm 25 Psalm 25, and we shall sing from verses 1 to 7. <coughs> Psalm 25, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> Here we have this humble request and pleading <clears throat> from the psalmist. as he has come to see who, we are, who he is and how much of the grace of God he needs and the guidance of the Lord. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. I trust in you continually. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my foes gloat over me. No one who set his hope in you will ever suffer such disgrace, but those who act with treachery, humiliating shame will face. Not only is he pleading, we see this uh, request, humble request to the Lord to guide. O oh Lord, reveal to me your ways and all your paths. Help me to know, direct and guide me in your truth. Instruct me in the way to go. You are my Savior and my God. All day I hope in you alone. Remember, Lord, your love and grace, which from past ages you have shown Yes, do we see the language of self-examination? And the goal of self-examination is not to lead to self, but to Savior, to confess and to lay hold of his love and grace. And yes, even that confession of sin, verse 7, do not recall my sins of youth or my rebellious evil ways. Remember me in your great love, for you, O Lord, are good always. And so may we stand and sing to God's praise.
And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his eternal peace in the Lord Jesus Christ, our faithful King and Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. Of course, there's fellowship luncheon in the hall. <laughs>